Hello, this is Joan Fernley, your French diction coach for choirs, and this is part two of La Le Bon Vin. Now, if you're looking for the diction video, that is part one, and you'll find the link in the description box below. In this part two video, we will be taking a deep dive into the story of Le Canard Blanc, the white duck. And that story is at the core of La Le Bon Vin, as well as other folk songs. Now, the origin of the white duck story has baffled historians and musicologists for a very long time, but I'm stubborn and with a bit of luck, I think I uncovered the key to this mystery. And here's a hint, it's linked to the French Revolution. I will only be scratching the surface of this topic and I would hope that other historians, other researchers would pick up where I've left off. And if you're one of those researchers, of course, please cite my research, but mostly comment below and let me know what you're working on. I'd be very curious to know what you find out. Now, as always, like, share and subscribe. And now let's get started. The story of the white duck is probably the most enigmatic folk song out of the entire French folk song repertoire. There's just no other song like it. And I think the fact that it's enigmatic has contributed to the idea that the song is ancient. Some speculate that it goes as far back as pre-Christian times, where the duck would have been a mythical creature. And why not? It's certainly worth exploring all possibilities. But so far, I have only found vague speculation about this idea and no evidence. A more credible theory is that the song came about in medieval times. This comes from musicologists that have studied the song tunes, but that's a comment about the tunes, not the story. And I'm interested in the story, not the tune. Today we think of songs as having both their unique tunes and their unique stories, but that's not how old folk songs work. There will inevitably be the mixing and recycling of old tunes and tropes with new lyrics to suit the times. Now a final argument supporting the song's ancient roots is based in both true and misunderstood history. The song is said to come from the west of France, roughly from the area in the yellow circle, and it just so happens that this is at the center of the regions where a large proportion of French colonists came from. You'll find no argument from me on those two points. Where things fall apart is the belief that any folk song strongly embedded in French Canadian culture would have had to have arrived under the old French regime, perhaps as far back as the 17th century. But that's a misunderstanding of history and there'll be more on that later. Finally, I want to be very clear about two concepts to consider in our understanding of this folk song. On the one hand, there is the meaning attributed to the song as it's been passed down from generation to generation. On the other hand, you have the origins which may very well have been lost to history. As far as the meaning of the song goes, children might see it as a kind of fairy tale, but the adults in the room see it as a tale of seduction. And knowing what I know now, I think it can be traced back to the 18th century, specifically the French Revolution. This video will be in four chapters. I will begin with an overview of the duck story, the typical interpretations and variants. Next, I will present my research findings that suggest a French Revolution connection. And then this will be followed by an overview of the refrains of this song and an interpretation of the two most common refrains. And finally, we'll consider how this song might have made it to Canada. Our story starts with the line, Derrière chez nous y a un état, which basically means something like, down yonder, there's a pond. Or you might have, mon père a fait faire un état, which means, my father built a pond. These are classic tropes of French folk songs. Once you start paying attention, you find that kind of setup everywhere. It's a lot like saying, once upon a time, or it was a dark and stormy night. Now, some variations add a bit of extra information about the pond, particularly its size. It is larger than it is long. It is small. It's not large. And again, just a basic introduction. However, you're in good company if you think the pond might be a metaphor for the marital bed, because there are countless folk songs about fathers marrying off their daughters. Anyway, as this is a duck pond, let's throw in some ducks. Okay, maybe that's too many, considering that most versions specify three ducks. Now, why three ducks? Why not five or two? A likely explanation is that three is simply a very popular number in many folk songs. In one, the father might build a house with three gables. In another, he might be marrying off three daughters. 
but you'll also find three just about everywhere in religions and philosophies, not to mention the Trinity, as France is Catholic. So back to our ducks. One of them is white and another is black, or at the very least one is white. I think we can all agree that white is usually a symbol of purity and virginity, and that fits right into our seduction metaphor. And while black may be more sinister, it might just be there for contrast to make the white duck stand out both literally and figuratively. Now enters our duck hunting prince with his long gun. Honestly, do I need to explain this? But then again, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And now the dramatic moment. He aims for the black duck and kills the white duck. If your first thought is that this is a metaphor of a prince seducing a virgin, you are in very good and crowded company. And while I can accept this idea, it doesn't explain why it was necessary to point out the fact that the prince has terrible aim. His intended target was the black duck. So why the mistake? Did he just pick the wrong girl? Anyway, then someone exclaims, Oh, prince, you shot my white duck. Now, beginning with this next line where the duck bleeds under his wing, the song begins to branch out into two main sets of lyrics. The lyrics most often sung today include this death scene and a bleeding white duck supports the seduction metaphor. But you could also consider Christian symbolism related to sacrifice. You have the bleeding lamb of God or the pelican in her piety. Not to mention Jesus on the cross, pierced on his side, which parallels the spot where our duck was shot. Now, after this death scene comes diamonds flowing from its eyes, silver and gold from its beak, and sometimes you might even get wheat. In other versions, you get compensation. Either the woman demands payment of 600 francs, or the prince offers her a silver necklace. This wealth that follows the duck's death is a universal constant found in all versions, and no matter how you count it, the wealth that follows the duck's death is significant. Seen from a seduction angle, this wealth could illustrate the social advantages of spending quality time with a prince. In other words, it pays to be a courtesan. And from the mythical side, it can be understood that the ultimate sacrifice may cleanse the world and wipe away poverty. Next, one branch of the story asks the question, what are we going to do with all this money? Which is followed by the answer, we will build a convent and we will put all the young men and women in the convent. I found one version that was very specific, stating that it is Marianne who will be put in the convent. And finally, in some cases, the convent is not mentioned at all, and it is simply said that they will marry off their daughters with rich prospects. And they lived happily ever after. Clearly, having your white duck shot by a prince is very profitable, at least as far as the convent variants of the story goes. The story with the usual set of lyrics continues with the duck's death scene, where all its feathers fly away in the wind. Then three ladies gather up the feathers. We have three again. Why? Aside from three being a nice number, you might have the three Marys at Jesus' tomb, or even the three Graces. And finally, we're told that they will make a camp bed for passing travelers. Now keep in mind that a camp bed is probably best understood as a poor man's bed, which wouldn't normally contain something as valuable as duck feathers, but rather straw or something more affordable. So the seduction metaphor here, particularly with the prince, is problematic. Of course, there are other versions where it's said that they will make beautiful white duvets, and in one version, the prince simply says that they will both sleep in this bed. And this is where the song ends, and it's oddly anticlimactic. It's as if the author ran out of ideas. But now that we've gone through the whole song, the seduction metaphor is pretty obvious, and there's also room for a bit of mythical interpretation. And as I said before, I'm sure this is how many people understand the song and how it was passed down. Nevertheless, there still remain many unclear meanings, such as why the prince might have shot the wrong duck. These uneven interpretations suggest to me that the meaning of the song is somehow disconnected to its origin until now. So now let's revisit the story through a completely different lens. Our investigation begins with the Comte de Mirabeau, who was a French writer, orator, statesman, and a key figure of the early years of the French Revolution. He was a product of the Enlightenment, typical of his time, and he penned a lengthy essay on despotism, which was published in 1775, 
but the preface suggests the work was written a number of years prior when Louis XV was king. Two more editions followed, and the last one was published in 1792 after his death, when the revolution was in full swing. Three editions of a book says a lot about the popularity of his work. In Mirabeau's book, you will find a footnote that talks about Sultan Hussein, a real prince of Persia who reigned during the time of Louis XIV. Mirabeau says, The Shah Hussein made many acts of devotion and alms after having shot and killed a duck to which he wished no harm, but just wanted to frighten it. This is our duck shooting prince. But why did he end up in an 18th century French essay on despotism? Well, the paragraph that comes before the footnote holds a hint. Mirabeau says, Here's what the kings don't understand, because they have a way of thinking and feeling that is different from the common man, the source of which must be their stupid education. It's not the interest for the nation that guides this education, but rather their teachers are taken out of the courtesan class. How could there be any hope of a decent education when placed in such hands? This is a critique of the monarchy, not in a revolutionary way, but rather a call for reform. Now, Mirabeau was not alone in retelling this story, but he was probably the most famous author. And these authors likely found their duck story in the writings of Thomas Gordon, who was an 18th century Scotsman, writer, and promoter of republicanism. Among other things, Gordon's claim to fame is his translation of the ancient Roman writings of Tacitus, which also included discussions and critiques on contemporary issues. His translations became the standard reference until at least the end of the 18th century, so it's no wonder it crossed the English Channel and was read by reformers in France. Now bear with me as I will highlight a few passages because this is central to our understanding of the duck story. Shah Hussein was a prince of infinite good nature, full of generosity, full of mercy and compassion, his mind of that delicacy and tenderness, that he was startled and alarmed upon having shot a duck in one of his canals when he meant only to have frightened her. He thought himself polluted with blood and for expiation had recourse to acts of devotion and alms deeds. He gave immense charities, built monasteries, endowed hospitals, performed long pilgrimages. Now what availed his good nature, what his compassion or his religion? He would not hurt a duck, but suffered his subjects to be pillaged and undone, brought war and desolation upon his country. The poor man saw the duck killed, but saw not the oppressions of his people, nor heard their cries. When he was told that the public enemy approached to Isaphan, he said, it was the business of the ministers to look to that. They had armies ready. For his part, if his palace at Farabath were but left him, he should be content. Into what insensibility, what weakness, and therefore into what contempt had this poor harmless prince brought himself by trusting blindly to selfish seducers. A prince who neglects his affairs will always be contemned, and from the moment he is contemned, he ceases to be secure. People will be turning their eyes and minds towards a successor, growing impatient for a change, and perhaps ready to make one. Clearly, this is a cautionary tale. Hussein might have started out as a kind prince who was incredibly remorseful after shooting a duck. But having been wholly misguided and unprepared for his responsibilities, he ended up like so many kings before him. He was neglectful of his duties and ultimately cruel. Not only does it lead to his own peril, but he takes the country down with him. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that this story is the origin story of the white duck. And if that's the case, what does the rest of the story mean? Our Persian prince story takes care of the first four lines of the song. Well, almost. Our version mentions three ducks. Why? Hang on to your hats. In 1789, France is facing a major financial crisis. And to deal with this, Louis XVI called up the Etat Généraux, the Estates General, to come up with a viable solution to deal with this crisis. This was serious. The last time a French king called up the Estates General was in 1614. Now, the Estates General are made up of three estates with different powers. The clergy, the nobility, and the people, known as the Third Estate. Now, this last group accounted for over 90% of the French population, but only the rich bourgeoisie had the privilege of attending. And finally, presiding over everyone, sat the monarch, Louis XVI. 
These are our three ducks. Now you may think this is a stretch, but stay with me. When all is said and done, it will make sense. Our next line is, vis à le noir, tu as le blanc, where the prince shoots the wrong duck, which raises two questions. What do these colors represent, and why does the prince shoot the wrong duck? So let's start with the first question. In the early days of the revolution, there were calls to reform the monarchy, not abolish it. However, by the spring of 1793, it was the reign of terror and civil wars broke out in the West, opposing the monarchists known as les Blancs, the whites, and les Bleus, the revolutionaries who are by now staunch republicans. It follows that the white duck represents the monarchy, and since there's no such thing as a blue duck in nature, the black duck represents the revolutionaries. So now, why did the prince shoot the wrong duck? And to answer that question, allow me to introduce Carl Wilhelm Ferdinand, the Duke of Brunswick and also the head of the Prussian army. It just so happens that in April 1792, France declared war on Austria. And by July, Prussia sided with Austria and both countries began planning their French invasion with the clear intention of turning back the clock and restoring the king to his full royal rights. No monarchy in Europe wanted a republic as a neighbor. The Duke gave the citizens of Paris full warning in what is known as the Brunswick Manifesto. I'll spare you the full thing, but here are some highlights. To restore the king to the security and the liberty of which he is now deprived, and to place him in a position to exercise once more the legitimate authority which belongs to him. That the members of the National Guard who shall fight against us and who are taken with arms in their hands shall be treated as enemies and punished as rebels that the inhabitants of the towns and villages who may dare to defend themselves against us shall be punished, their houses burned or destroyed. The city of Paris and all its inhabitants shall be required to submit at once to the king. If the Chateau of the Tuileries is entered by force or attacked, if the least violence be offered to their majesties, and if their safety and their liberty are not immediately assured, we will inflict an ever-memorable vengeance by delivering over the city of Paris to military execution and complete destruction. Clearly the Duke was not messing around, but his manifesto didn't have the intended effect. Quite the opposite. The French were pretty clear about that. Nevertheless, this was no laughing matter. It was discovered that the Duke maintained a secret correspondence with Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who was, let's not forget, an Austrian. This fired up the revolutionaries who stormed the Tuileries on August 10th and accused the king of treason. In the end, the manifesto that was meant to scare the revolutionaries into submission backfired. It was a classic case of overplaying your hand. The duke is our prince who threatened to hunt down the revolutionaries and in the end killed the monarchy. The next line in the song speaks of the duck bleeding under his wing. The revolution was a bloody affair, and here I think our author is drawing a parallel between the king's death and a religious sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Indeed, French monarchs weren't simply religious, they were considered ordained by God. Take aim at the monarch, and you are taking aim at God. What now follows the duck's death is immense wealth, either diamonds and gold and silver in this version, or from the prince himself, along with the purchase of a convent. If you recall, this is what our Persian prince did. As Gordon said, he thought himself polluted with blood and for expiation had recourse to acts of devotion and alms deeds. He gave immense charities, built monasteries, endowed hospitals. You might as well say convent. And speaking of money, we should never lose sight of the fact that the French Revolution was at its core a financial crisis. And that's why the Estates General were called in the first place. And it just so happens that the clergy is swimming in wealth. Not your lowly parish priest, of course, but bishops and cardinals were immensely wealthy. And the institution itself, headed by the Vatican, held vast amounts of wealth. So in late 1789, the freshly created Assemblée Nationale simply confiscated the wealth of the church. And that was just the beginning. As the revolution progressed and the state needed more cash, they included many more goods into the collective pot, including plenty of crown real estate and the goods owned by nobles that fled the revolution. But you can't simply spend land in churches. These assets need to be converted into cash. 
The solution was a scheme that is best described as a kind of IOU known as an assignat. Basically, you buy an assignat and the state will pay you back when they've sold off some land. And the value of the assignat are guaranteed against the biens nationaux, the wealth of the state. The wealth that comes from the duck is the wealth that comes from the clergy, the monarchist nobles that fled the revolution, and eventually the king. France finally had cash, and that takes care of those two lines of the duck spilling out wealth. But what about the duck's feathers flying in the wind? For that, I need to continue the story of the assignat. This scheme was working so well that the Assemblée succumbed to temptation. It pulled out the printing press and printed more and more assignat. The value of the assignat plummeted and inflation was out of control. Once again, France is facing a financial crisis and the now free press isn't pulling any punches. In 1796, these short lines were making the rounds. The first four lines mock the various political players, and on the fifth line, we get to the heart of the matter. Les assignats au vent, the assignats flying in the wind, which sounds an awful lot like toutes ces plumes s'en vont au vent. I think our duck feathers are in fact worthless assignats. It's like throwing money out the window and watching it fly away. Next, we have the line about the three ladies, but we'll skip that bit for now and finish our assignat story and consider the last two lines of the song, where it is said that with the feathers, they will make a camp bed for any passing travelers. As I mentioned earlier, a camp bed is not something you would stuff with valuable duck feathers. Rather, you might stuff it with something far less valuable, such as straw, or maybe something even less valuable. How about stuffing it with a bunch of worthless assignat? Now, of course, I did mention earlier that some versions say the feathers will make lovely duvets, and in another version, the prince says that they could both sleep together in the bed. But there happens to be another version that I didn't mention earlier that suggests that the king, the queen, and their children could sleep in that bed. Is this a deathbed? Regardless of all these variants, fundamentally, I think the duck's feathers are a metaphor for assignats that were once valuable, but now are only good for stuffing camp beds. So now let's look at the three ladies. Who could they be and why are there three? Perhaps they're allegorical. Consider this monument, the Monument à la République. Granted, it was unveiled about a hundred years after the revolution, but it's consistent with the Roman antiquity inspired imagery in vogue during the revolution and the enlightenment. At the base of this monument, you will find three female figures. They are liberty, equality, and brotherhood, fraternité. Each of these ideals are personified as women, which was a typical artistic practice right into the 19th century. These are the three women gathering the duck's feathers. It is only by following these three Republican ideals that the nation can finally crawl out of the financial mess it inherited from the monarchy and overambitious men. But we're not done with this statue. We need to consider the woman at the top of the monument. This is Marianne. She is the female character that you see to this day on all kinds of images in France. You will also find her on the Assignat, such as this one from December 1792, after the monarchy was abolished. Granted, it's unclear to me if she would have been called Marianne in 1792, and there are many origin stories around this Marianne, as well as the simple fact that Marianne is a popular name in France. However, I find it interesting that in one of the versions of our song, it is explicitly stated that it is Marianne that is shipped to the convent. Is this literal or metaphorical? Your guess is as good as mine. I hope I've convinced you that the story of the white duck, as far as its origin goes, is a clever political commentary. And it's not simply a song that emerged mysteriously. I think it was intentional. And seeing it through a revolutionary lens combined with the original Persian duck story provides an interpretation for every line of the song. But we're not done yet. What about the refrains? They've often seemed quite disconnected to the duck story, and I've always found that to be quite puzzling. But here again, there may be a connection. I looked through a number of 19th century songbooks and online resources, and I think we can categorize the refrains into three categories. You have the flirtatious dance refrains of the matchmaking kind, you have wind theme refrains, and you have game refrains. And the large number of flirtatious and dance refrains 
in our first group feeds right into the notion that this is a tale of seduction. And I agree. I think this is how many people understand the song. And I think a lot of these refrains would have been borrowed from other songs. And these should just simply be taken at face value as they may be later versions. Case in point, the French Canadian folklorist Ernest Gagnon in his 1880 publication noted that one of these refrains was associated with an entirely different song in Canada. So let's focus our attention on the next two categories, the wind-themed refrains such as Val Bon Vent and the game refrains such as En Roulant Ma Boule. Interestingly, I came across a version of the Val Bon Vent refrain that uses the same tune we all recognize. The difference here is that it's the drum, the tambour, calling young men to the regiment. It's clearly a military song, and it comes from this turn-of-the-century collection of old songs from Les Pays Nantais. This is the region around Nantes. And the lovely drawing leaves you in no doubt that it was sung by soldiers. In fact, I came across an ethnographic website where some versions are listed as being sung by conscripted men. These wind-themed refrains are a naval reference. This is a time when ships were completely dependent on wind power, and to leave port, you had to wait for the good wind, le bon vent. The fact that this is a songbook from the Nantes region is significant. This city was at the heart of the civil wars known as les guerres de Vendée, which began in the spring of 1793 during the reign of terror. At that time, many in the west of France felt the revolutionary government was seriously overstepping their bounds. They had guillotined the king, they were persecuting the church, and as the last straw, they called up 300,000 young men to fight their revolutionary wars. The people of the West protested and aligned themselves with the monarchist counter-revolutionaries. They were Les Blancs. Could this be the birthplace of our song, and was it sung by the counter-revolutionaries? Whatever the answer, it is quite possible that our duck song was one of the many songs sung by soldiers both on land and on the seas. Now let's turn to the other refrain, En roulant ma boule roulant. The words are simple. They basically say, as I roll my ball, my rolly ball. No doubt we're talking about lawn bowling games that have been popular for centuries in many regions. But as always, there are metaphors. And the inscription at the bottom of the image says that this ball game is a dangerous game where there appear strokes of love and of luck. For who is not content with one often risks losing two. The moral of the story, don't get greedy. And you guessed it, there's a revolutionary connection. Back in 1789, one month after the opening of the Estates General in May, and one month before the storming of the Bastille in July, the Assemblée Nationale was created. The king was still around, of course, but now his powers would be in check. This is the dawn of democracy in France, and that means people will be voting. And right from the start, the Assemblée Nationale outlined their voting system. They didn't cast paper ballots, they voted with black and white balls. How it all works is described in great detail in the 1791 publication reporting on the laws voted by the Assemblée. Here's just a short excerpt. They will cast their black or white balls in the boxes of the same color, where the black one states the accused is convicted and where the white one states the accused is not convicted. Refrains like En roulant ma boule may find their origin in lawn bowling games. And with politics so often being like a game, you could imagine the députés in the Assemblée twirling their white and black voting balls in their hand as they contemplate their next political gamble, with the fate of France quite literally in their hands. Now, the members of the Assemblée didn't invent this system. They borrowed it from Freemasonry. It just so happens that many French thinkers and reformers were in fact Freemasons. And Mirabeau, who I have to thank for starting me down this duck story path, was in fact one of many Freemasons in the Assemblée. We've now covered the whole song, so let's do a recap of some of the key points. First, the core story of the white duck comes straight from the Persian prince story, and that places our song right in the 18th century when this story was circulating among French reformers. Second, I'm convinced that the version we all recognize with the duck's feathers flying in the wind and the three ladies picking up the feathers was a clever political song that was a product of the French Revolution. 
but it might have gone through a few iterations. It's conceivable that the versions mentioning the convent might point to an earlier version that predates the revolution because it simply more closely matches our Persian prince story. But here I can only speculate. Third, when seen in this political light, you no longer see this mysterious song emerging from the past. Rather, you see the writing of a clever social commentator. And who could that commentator be? Well, perhaps a député in the Assemblée, or a simple notary in Nantes, or even a priest who fled to Canada. And that leads me right into my final chapter. How did this song make it to Canada when Canada was British and it wasn't even Canada yet? What I remember from my high school history classes was that by 1763, the French packed up, abandoned the French colonists, and never looked back. Anything French sung in Canada by the 19th century would have inevitably arrived before 1763. But that's inaccurate. Paradoxically, by 1764, communication between France and its old colony improved. Once the treaty was signed, the French and the British were now at peace, and ships sailed more frequently across the Atlantic even in winter. Also, contrary to the old French regime, the British had a free press, which also boosted communication. This peace lasted until 1778, when the two nations were once again at war. Then peace returned in 1783 and lasted a decade until 1793. And finally, the two countries enjoyed a lasting peace beginning in 1815. This means that during the early years of the revolution, right up until 1793, the French and British were still at peace. And it was at that time that many of the French immigrés that fled the revolution were taken in by the British. After all, these French were monarchists and not too keen on the revolutionary wars. Out of all the immigrés, 140 settled in Canada. Now that's a small number, but many were educated and influential. Most notably were the highly educated contingent of 49 Catholic clergy that gave the local clergy a significant boost in numbers, and they left a lasting mark on French Canadian society. So it's possible that the song made its way to Canada in that short window of time, but it's also possible that it traveled after 1815 when the Napoleonic Wars were over. Now, at this point, it's difficult to say when it would have crossed over to Canada. I think more research is needed here. And I haven't found any trace of the song before the 19th century, whether in song collections or in commentaries. But I only have access to what is available to the general public. So historians might have more resources to look into this. Now, it's often said that people did not write down oral traditions. And that's only partly true. There are accounts of folk songs. And I haven't found, again, any accounts of this song. Again, absence of proof is not proof of absence, but considering what we know about our Persian prince duck story, and what I hope is a convincing interpretation of the song through a revolutionary lens, I think that in this case, it simply didn't exist before the 18th century. Now, maybe someone did write this song down, but if the song was the creation of a counter-revolutionary in Nantes during the civil wars, it may have simply gone up in smoke. We might also consider that the song may have been penned at the dawn of the 19th century, when the country took a deep breath, picked up the pieces, and enjoyed a bit more stability under the era of Napoleon. They may have finally sat down and penned a catchy song that eventually caught on in Canada. Derrière chez nous, y a un état. Well, there you have it, my take on the origins of the white duck song, V'là le bon vin. Thank you for watching. I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. Please share your comments below. Let me know if you're working on this song or if you're researching it. And of course, like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, bye.